right, so today what we're going to do is talk about existential instantiation and generalization. So first, we're going to do an example of generalization because it's easier. And then we're going to do an example of instantiation. And then hopefully just those two examples should be enough to get the point across of this concept of existential instantiation and generalization. So what we're doing with um, existential generation generalization before we get into the proof is basically saying, okay, what I want to show is that there exists something that is something, right? Um, and the way I do that is by finding an example of that something, for example, right? In what we're doing, I want to show that there exists someone who is talented. What I need to do is find a case where that's true. I find someone who is talented. And as you can guess, we're going to show that Bruno Mars is talented. And then because I have found that that person is talented, I can existentially generalize that statement and then say that there exists a person who is talented. And we know that that's true. That's a valid conclusion to make because we found that example. We found someone who is talented. So that's the basic idea of what we're doing. Now let's actually do it. So let's represent this, these premises we have. All singers are talented, right? So that's going to be for all X. If X is a singer, then X is talented. And then to say Bruno Mars is a singer, we simply, we simply substitute a B for our X. We say Bruno Mars is a singer. The conclusion we want to reach is that there exists something in this universe or someone such that that person X or that thing X is talented, right? So let's start by universally instantiating line one as we learned in last video, right? And what I want to do is instantiate to the letter B for Bruno Mars because that's going to be relevant to this proof. It's going to be helpful for us. So let's instantiate line one to say that if Bruno Mars is a singer, then Bruno Mars is talented. So that's line one, universal instantiation. Now what I can do is modus ponens from lines two and three and conclude that Bruno Mars is talented because it is the case that he is a singer. So that comes from lines two, three, and modus ponens. So now I have found that specific example, right? I have found someone who is talented. So what I can then say is that there does in fact exist an X such that X is talented. So that comes from line four and universal, universal generalization. And that's the end of the proof. We got what we wanted. Now the thing with existential generalization, right, is that it doesn't matter if you have a constant, like a constant like B here, or if we had um, for, I don't know, a different example, um, uh, inst universally instantiated to a variable, it doesn't matter which was the case, we can existentially generalize both constants and variables to a variable. So you get that kind of freedom and liberty there. We just, in this case, it happened to be more convenient to universally instantiate to a constant and then generalize. It might be true that it's more convenient for you to universally instantiate to a variable and then existentially generalize. This is just one example. But now what we're going to get into is our example of existential instantiation. Now, existential instantiation, it's not that difficult of a concept, right? It's just like universal instantiation, right? Instead of universally instantiating to a variable, when we existentially instantiate, it's always to a constant, right? Because an existential statement says that there exists something, right? So it's not true for everything. It's just saying that there exists something, right? It might be one thing, it might be a few things. And so when we existentially instantiate, we have to name that something. We have to give an example, right? And we have to do that with a constant, not a variable. So that's pretty straightforward. The tricky part comes with the fact that we are gener uh, instantiating to a constant, right? Because the rule of thumb with existential instantiation is that you cannot instantiate to a constant that has already appeared in your proof. 
So let's 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 get into this proof and then talk about why why that needs to be the case, right? So let's start by represent symbolically representing our premises, right? All pizzas are delicious. So this is going to be for all x. If x is a pizza, then x is delicious. And then line two will be some pizzas are cheap. So I'll say that there exists an x such that x is a pizza and x is cheap. And the conclusion I'd like to reach is that there exists something that is cheap and delicious. So there exists an x such that x is cheap and x is delicious. Now, clearly, this looks like a conclusion we should be able to get to, right? Because all pizzas are delicious, some pizzas are cheap, which means we could probably, which means we can definitely find a pizza that is cheap and delicious. So that means that there will exist something that is cheap and delicious. So, like I said, we cannot instantiate to a constant that has already appeared in our proof, right? And because we have existential generalization, uh, instantiation, which means we have to instantiate to a constant, we're going to want both of our universal and existential instantiations to go to the same constant. So that way we can do some of our rules of inference, our rules of implication on them, right? Now, here's the thing, right? I'm going to do something wrong. Let's say I universally instantiate first, right? I universally instantiate line one and we'll just use the constant A, right? It doesn't really matter what constant we choose because we don't have any so far in our proof. So I want to instantiate to A and just say A is something where if A is P, then P is D, right? If A is a pizza, then P is delicious. And now what I would want to do is existentially instantiate line two, right? And I want to say, all right, well, I'll just go. Oh, why did I put P? I'll just use the same constant, right? I'll say, oh, well, um, there exists an A where A is a pizza and A is cheap. Here's the issue. So I did my UI first and then I did an EI. Now the UI is valid, right? Because for all X, so I can go to any constant I want. So I'm saying if A is a pizza, then it's delicious. And then I did my existential, right? And I said, a is a pizza and why did I write the wrong thing again? And A is cheap. There you go. There you go. A is cheap. The issue here, right, is that with existential instantiation, I know that something exists, but I don't know specifically what that thing is, right? And when we instantiate, we, use, we just choose a constant to stay as that placeholder, right? We're like, this. we'll say that this is the thing that exists, right? However, when I universally instantiate first, I am bringing that thing into existence. I'm saying, hey, A exists. If it's a pizza, then it's delicious, right? And then when I'm existentially instantiating, I'm saying on top of that, A is a pizza and it's cheap. But I, I have no idea what A is. So I, I can't do that, right? If it already exists in my proof, I cannot just existentially instantiate to that variable for, for my own convenience and make all these claims about this constant that I know nothing about. So I cannot go on to say that A is both a pizza and cheap when I know nothing about A. So what do we do? Well, what we have to do is existentially instantiate before we universally instantiate. Now, why is that different? Let me show you why that's different. So I'm going to existentially instantiate first. I'm going to do that for line two. So I'm going to instantiate to the constant A, and I'm going to say A is a pizza and A is cheap, right? I just brought it into existence. I know that there's something that exists that's a pizza and cheap. We'll just call it A. So that comes from line two and existential instantiation. So that's my example. Now, from line one, because line one is a universal thing, I can apply this to anything and say, if anything is a pizza, then it's delicious. Now, I can put that on top, I could draw that conclusion on top of my existential instantiation and say, hey, I have this thing A, but I keep writing the wrong thing. I have this thing A, it's a pizza and it's cheap, right? What I can also say is that if A is a pizza, oh, sorry about that, something just indented, hold on. All right, I don't know what that was about. Sorry about that. But anyway, I have this thing, A, that's a pizza and it's cheap. 
And I can add on to that and say, hey, if A is a pizza, then it's also delicious. Because I'm not, I'm not claiming it's a pizza, although I do know it is. I know that it's a pizza and cheap, but I'm not making this wild assertion on top of it. And what I'm just saying is if it's the case that it's a pizza, then it'll also be delicious. This is something that I think is like difficult for people to understand at first. It's like, why is it important that we existentially instantiate before we universally instantiate? Or why can't we existentially instantiate to a constant that has already appeared in our proof? It's just the way it is. It makes logical sense. It can really trip you up and like ruin an entire proof for you. So that's why I'm spending so much time talking about it because it's really important that you know this. So the general rule moving forward, right, is that if you need to universally and existentially instantiate in a proof, always do your existential instantiations first. And then you can universally instantiate to your constants that make it more convenient for you. If it's the case that you need to existentially instantiate multiple statements, again, since you can't existentially instantiate to a constant that has already appeared in a proof, you will have to existentially instantiate to a different constant for each statement that you're instantiating. And it's a lot of words. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. I hope it does make sense because for some people it just lands and sticks. Some people it takes some time. That's okay if this doesn't make sense at first. Just know the rule of thumb existentially instantiate before universally instantiating. So now that we've said all of that about instantiating, let's finish our proof. So this came from line three. Oh, that's a two. This came from line, that did not come from line three. It came from line one and universally instantiating. So I want to reach the conclusion that we get CA and DA. Well, what I could do right now is simplify line three, right? I could simplify line three and just say PA. So that came from line three and simplification. We could get a little modus ponens action going on and conclude that A is in fact delicious. That came from lines four or five and modus ponens. Now on line seven, what I could do is commutativity to get CA and PA. So that came from line three and com. Uh, then we can simplify this to just get CA. So this came from line seven and simplification. On line nine, we can get CA and DA, which is what we want. CA and DA. So that came from what lines? Uh, five, eight, right? No, no, no. That came from lines six and eight and conjunction. And then finally, we can existentially generalize the statement and say that there exists an X such that x is cheap and x is delicious line nine existential generalization so that's it for today's video existential generalization and instantiation again try not to get too confused with the instantiation you might have to do some more example problems from a textbook or something to really nail this in it might not make sense to you and that's okay if it doesn't make sense to you at first but just go with the fact that you need to existentially instantiate before any other kind of instantiation. That's just what you gotta do. If you made it to the end of this video, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it and I hope you learned something.